Okay, we are live right now. So first, I want to thank everyone for joining us for the third book interview again, like uh, today. And then a special thanks for Tom, who I met about, I believe, was like seven years ago on Mars, like, uh, like uh, to join us today right. with his new book and sharing. And then I just recently heard Tom move to Quebec, a beautiful, fun place. So anyway, so as usual, I like to just jump to the audience because this is the key we want the guests there. So. Tom, why don't you start with uh, intro briefly introduce yourself and then the motivation to like uh, for writing this book? Sure. Uh, well, my name is Tom Rand. Um, my day job is I'm a managing partner of Arcturn Ventures. So Arcturn is a, a privately backed clean tech venture fund based out of Toronto, um, and we invest in technologies that uh, I believe can really move the needle on some of the more significant problems that we face, including climate. Uh, and resource scarcity. So that's my day job. I'm a venture guy, um, but I also write books uh, about climate and clean tech because I am one of those people that stays up late at night worrying about the possible heat death of our civilization. I think the systemic risk we face from climate is far greater than uh, is broadly understood. And uh, therefore I think we need to move fast on this. And this book in particular I wrote because I was really frustrated by this ping pong back and forth between the left and the right as to who's got the ground on climate, who's got the better solutions on climate. Very frustrated by those on the left who want to blame capitalism. I don't really even know what that means. I'm happy to talk more about that. But the idea that we're going to throw out our economic system in favor of La Revolution is naive and distracting at best. Uh, but at the same time, the business community, even those who are engaged on climate, seem to feel like we can nibble around the edges of the economy and make little changes, snips and, and bits here and there and solve this problem. And we can't. This requires a massive rewiring of our economy. Um, and uh, we have to keep that economy functioning while we do that. We have to build a big democratic tent while we do that, which means throwing out capitalism a la revolution um, doesn't make any sense. So I wrote this book frustrated by both those sides. And I think there is a pragmatic solution right down the center. And that's what the book's all about. Rewiring capitalism to solve a problem that keeps me for one up at night, most nights. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. And then just a quick kind, kind of follow up question. So we know like every book, especially a good one. And then I'm sure like everyone who actually read your book will say you really put a lot of your like a uh, vision and a lot of thought in there. And then it, it always take time. To write the book and then i know you started to wanted to write this book when you know you have a you are you you are going to have a newborn and then it took some time to finish this book right so and then we also know the world changed very fast so what like just quickly like when you started to write this book either for yourself or for the war surrounding you what has changed from the beginning yeah the moment yeah. You it's a good question so yeah when i started to write this book um i had just found out i was going to be a father um, which was unexpected, but it turns out to be a real joy. Um, obviously, people who know that know that. Um, but at the time, you know, one of the reasons that I didn't have didn't think about having kids was I really am concerned that um, you know the place we're headed is not nice. And right after I found out that I was going to be a father, I was actually in the Hague in uh, in 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 Europe at a conference called the Planetary Security Conference, which is really a gathering of the military and national security establishment around the world to talk about uh, climate. And the way they characterize climate is not as a thing in and of itself, but as they call it, is a threat multiplier. In other words, it, it does things that exacerbate and pulls on existing social fabric and, and tears social fabric that is already stretched. So an example that I learned about, and again, I'm in the audience, I'm about to become a father, I'm already worried about this stuff. And there's these people with lots of medals on their chest, you know, talking about things like, you know, every single refugee that hit Europe's borders in the year 2016 was from a water stressed country. And that led to uh, an influx of refugees that in Germany, for example, took a million of them. That led to a resurgence of the far right. So you saw a rise of the Nazi movement in Germany as a result of climate change because people had arrived in Europe because they were starving and, 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 and there was instability in the Mideast because of a lack of water, essentially, Syria in particular. So the military talks about it in those terms, 
I just discovered I was going to be a dad. And so it's, a, it's overwhelming. Yet, I find that that qualitative description of the threat, where we're not talking about nickels and dimes, we're not talking about the perfect cost-benefit analysis on climate policy, we have senior people saying, look, there are lines we cannot cross. We must do what's necessary not to cross that line. Three years later, COVID arrives. Um, I don't think anybody would look at a cost-benefit spreadsheet and calculate the cost per life of us staying at home to flatten that curve. We did what was necessary because there's a line we cannot cross. That is the nature of systemic risk. And I think one of the things I hope comes out of COVID is the notion that we look, first of all, to our leaders to protect us from risks that frighten us. COVID frightens us. We're frightened for our, our relatives and our grandmothers and so on. So we act accordingly. The challenge we have is in communicating that systemic risks that are slow motion, like climate, are really as urgent. And if we can communicate that, if we can get it across in the kind of language the military uses with serious people, um, I think we have shown we are willing to do what's necessary to stop those risks from accumulating. And I think that has changed in the last month. There are other changes in the corporate community. I think lots of corporate leaders are now willing to engage with clean tech, with solutions, with moving capital, with trying to be a part of the solution to this problem. Whereas five years ago, they kind of were you know, making noises. So I think there's lots of smaller changes that are happening in the corporate community. But the biggest one is I think is the way in which we talk about existential threats and the role of the public and private sectors and the role of the citizens in addressing those threats. And that's, I think, a new platform by which we might talk about climate risk when the dust settles on COVID. Thank you for sharing. And now, like, back to your day, day job, like, a uh, vision thought. So what would you say are the role for startups, I mean, innovators, startups, and then venture in this? Are they playing significant role? Because, like, startup is really kind of small, and then a lot of things are set by the government in this, right? So what would your thought on this? Startup, investor, well, like, startup, investor, and innovator is critical. I mean, you know, technology is what will enable us to decouple environmental harm from economic activity. The deployment of technology is what will allow it to happen. So innovation is obviously critical, but I wouldn't overstate it. I mean, you know, it takes 10 years to commercialize something, even once it's invented and coming out of the labs, we in the venture world, it'll be 10 years before it's mainstream, right? Um, so it's as much about deployment now as it is about invention. I mean, the idea that we're gonna invent a magic bullet to solve this problem is nonsense. Um, it, that, first of all, we've been inventing things for 25 years and there is no magic bullet. This is a hard, difficult problem to solve. But I think more to the point is if a technology can't scale up to infrastructure level scale or mass deployment across an entire industry within five or 10 years, it's not gonna really contribute to the solution. So I think innovation needs to be coupled with a very aggressive deployment strategy, which will come from both the private sector as well as the public sector. It's deployment as well as innovation. Got it. And then we just got a question from Gotham, like from the audience. He said, like, I'm interested in knowing positive stories and example how profit-seeking companies are helping to save the planet. I'm sure you have sure. a ton of stories, so maybe yeah. you can share a few. I do. I'll give you my favorite one. Um, so as you could, uh, could imagine, energy storage, cheap, massive energy storage is kind of a holy grail. If you have cheap, massive energy storage at the utility scale, like gigawatts, not megawatts, then you don't really have a limit to the amount of solar and wind you can put on the grid. And as we know, solar and wind are the cheapest forms of new energy production in, on the planet. Cheaper than that gas, cheaper than nuclear, cheaper than, cheaper than anything else. So if you can solve the storage nut, you're really solving a big problem. And a company called HydroStore, we're invested in HydroStore, it's our flagship energy storage company. They store energy in the form of what's called advanced compressed air. So they essentially mine a 600 meter deep shaft. They build out a cavern the size of a football field, four stories high. And when you wanna store energy, you essentially flood that cavern with water you pump the water out to store energy and that column of water keeps the air in the cavern under pressure. 
And then when you want to get the energy back, you run it in reverse, the water pushes the air out and you get the energy back. And there's some, some nuance, but that's about it. So it's a, it's a giant battery made out of air, rock and water. And we believe you know, the cost point that HydroStore can build gigawatt scale stuff um, is about a third to a fifth of the cost of lithium ion batteries. And that's the innovator. Now, the partner we have, there is an, invest, an infrastructure fund out of France called Meridium. Meridium has invested in HydroStore in order to be the financial backer of large projects that get installed in California, in Arizona, in New York, in England, and so on and so forth. So now we have a profit-motivated innovator who's brought technology to market that's the, that's the, the Tesla killer on storage. And we have a large financial partner that smells money in large deployments of this stuff. And that partnership, which has taken sort of five or six years to bring to fruition, along with a big engineering company and EDC and a bunch of other large players, that consortium, that group that has gathered around Little Hydra Store, the startup, are capable of delivering on tens of billions of dollars of energy storage projects over the next five or six years, which in turn puts uh, a much higher ceiling on the amount of wind and solar that we can deploy which in turn solves our problem, right? Got it. Thanks for the example. Like, uh, and then now we talk about technology and things. So last week I interviewed Dr. Peter Victor. I'm I'm pretty sure you both know each other and like uh, you're in the space. So I one one conversation I had with Peter for the past year or two, and then we also talked about it last like uh, last week was AI and sustainability. Like just like innovation, like. AI innovation in general make things more efficient, and then efficient like uh, the way I see this because I'm more from the data science and AI stuff. I mean, we, I'm just those people think okay, AI is a future of things, but then it, like my belief was that kind of AI could help like your life and everything be more efficient and better. But then Peter like got me to thinking when AI and everything okay, everything is more efficient. Are that would that encourage people to consume more, which is not good for the planet? I wondered how your thought on this with all the Innovate, uh, invention, this, like uh, everything's become more efficient. Would that actually do the opposite? Like, yeah. uh, right? and I, I guess you get, you get my idea. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you to explain your thought. That's a classic problem, right? Efficiency yeah. has bounce back effects. So yeah. for example, you go to the store and you buy a more efficient fridge, you just put your inefficient fridge in the basement to keep your beer in and you're using more energy. So that's a classic problem in, in energy efficiency. And I think at the consumer level, it's probably true, um, but at the industrial and commercial level, it's not. When you bring a technology to bear, to so for example, we have a company called Parity Go. What Parity does is they make condo buildings more efficient. So in other words, you run some analytics, you have some sensors, and you affect the airflow and the HVAC and some other stuff. You lower the energy use in a condo building by 30 to 40%. Um, that condo building is not gonna deploy another hallway because the hallway that exists is being run more efficiently. These are corporations that when they save capital, that capital isn't deployed directly into other energy use stuff. Um, a factory, if you, if you lower the material inputs for a factory or you lower the energy input for a factory, that's profit for that factory. They don't buy another machine for the sake of buying another machine and producing more energy. So I think there's much less of a, of a bounce back effect in the commercial side because it's it's just cost savings. Whereas on the retail side, what do you do with your cost savings? You buy another toy, right? So I think it's different in personal life versus corporate life. And I think efficiencies brought to the corporate life are much stickier and do have lasting effects on the amount of energy consumption. Because I just think that the behavioral patterns are different in a corporation versus a household. But uh, it's, it, it is an interesting issue, yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, and then there's just so many angle, and then I, that's why I, I, I've been enjoying having that conversation with the Peter for the past two years. And then we talk again. Like it just has so many angle, we can actually talk about it. But it's good to hear from your perspective. So now the another question I would like to ask is, and also like you mentioned earlier, and also in your book, is like, so who do you think should be taking the lead? In implementing and guiding the direction of innovation, especially in the climate space, right? Who I, I'm sure we are all in this together. Same with the COVID and same with the environment things. But who, like, if you want to take one, who has slightly more push? 
Well, I think that's one of the primary points I'm making in the book, Climate Capitalism, right? That le the market left to its own devices is extremely good at innovating and inventing things. Um, but it often just turns out to be toys, right? I mean, people, people want, and, and so innovation and market forces, they, 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 they work really, really well together. When you're trying to solve a substantive problem of the common good, for example, finding a vaccine for COVID or eliminating emissions on climate, you need the public sector to be there to provide the framework by which the market operates. The market by itself will build all kinds of neat stuff. It does all that all the time. But it's underpinned by two things. One, even the core innovation in a lot of the toys we have, the phone that you have in your pocket, most of the core technology there was invented on the public dime, right? The GPS system, all the transistors, the touchscreen, Siri, all that stuff. It was commercialized by the folks in Silicon Valley, like myself and so on. They commercialize R&D. But the core R&D is always done on the public dime. It's been that way for a long, long time. So there's already a partnership that sits between the public and private sectors. And to think that the private sector innovates without the public as a foundational actor is like saying you look at the Golden Gate Bridge and you say, that bridge operates perfectly well without scaffolding. Why would you need all that scaffolding? Well, you can't build the bridge without the scaffolding. The fact that it operates without the scaffolding and you can't see it when it's built doesn't mean it wasn't there when it got built. And that's what the public sector does in terms of R&D. But more importantly, in terms of deployment and, and focusing on what kinds of R&D are important, the public sector has to provide the market signals. It has to provide a set of rules and a framework by which the private sector goes to solve a problem. The private sector by itself will not, cannot, and has not solved for carbon emissions. The only way innovation in the private sector will solve for carbon emissions is if the public sector says, there's a rule that you have to follow which says, here's a regulatory requirement on emissions, or here's a rule that provides an incentive to, re to reduce those emissions. But without the public sector putting that framework in place for the private sector to answer to, it's like something not having gravity. There's no force acting on it. It just floats around. The market just floats around. If you want to solve a serious problem, you have to put a force of gravity in play. And that's what a price of carbon is. It sucks things towards a particular outcome. And so I think that that interplay between the public and private sectors is precisely what climate capitalism is all about. There's details as to how we do that. But the notion the public sector can do it on its own is absolute nonsense. You need innovation, you need market forces, you need big corporates, you need trade, you need all that stuff. But to think that the market's gonna solve this problem without a very tough, aggressive public sector is also a myth. And it's that marriage, I think, that I'm talking about in this book. And, yep. and then now, like, we just got a timely question just tied up to what you just, like, uh mention and Andy. So another like a question from the audience is like, engaging stakeholder is so important to sustain climate capitalism. What challenge have you faced? What is your advice for companies who wants to be part of climate capitalism journey? journey? Uh, find partners that are, are willing to engage with you. Look, there's an enormous number of people that remain in the financial sector on corporate boards who just haven't figured out this problem yet, right? And just don't waste your time talking to them or trying to convince them this problem is real. I sent out an email the other day talking about you know, a, a talk I'm giving on Wednesday and I got a reply back from a fund manager who said, I think carbon dioxide is plant food. I don't know what the problem is. I'm not gonna reply to that email. I'm not gonna engage with that person. They're no longer on my priority list of people to think about partnerships with. So find actors in the corporate sector who have figured out the problem is real at the very least and then find ways to engage with them on their own terms, right? Nobody in the corporate environment is going to pay more for a solution if there's a lower cost solution. Now, all things being equal, what's different today than five years ago, all being equal, they might take the clean solution. And that's very different from five years ago. But you have to meet them on their own terms. You have to define a value prop that's meaningful to them. You have to solve a problem they have in their daily lives. Can't just be, we're solving climate together. That's not what their job is. Their job is to run a company. So you may have a solution 
that lowers the emissions, but that solution has to solve a problem in their day-to-day -day lives. It has to increase their profitability, not decrease their profitability. And you know, so that's the heavy lifting that we on the on the clean tech side have to do. At the same time, they're now meeting us halfway. If we can bring those solutions to market, you know, five years ago, a clean tech solution had to be 10 times faster, better, and cheaper to be considered because it wasn't normal business. Whereas now, all else being equal, a corporate leader might choose the clean solution. So at least those leaders are now meeting us halfway and they're willing to sort of extend a hand and try to get these solutions deployed. Finding those corporate leaders, that's the first job. Because if they're not that corporate leader, don't waste your time talking to them. Agree. And then now, like, a type of one of the questions I had in mind to ask was, so, like, you know, like, uh, you mentioned a lot, and then is there something that you could share with us of what Octurn, like, uh, ventures, how you are doing in terms of like, your investment philosophy and how you are up to working with the public and private sector in terms of your fund? So is anything sure. that you could share? So we don't work directly with the public. I mean, I do a lot of hand-waving myself as a citizen, um, but Octurn kind of sticks to its knitting. Um, we are interested in technologies that scale very, very quickly. And so, and so 10 years ago in fund one, so fund one was started in 2012 timeframe. Fund two, which is much larger, was started like about 18 months ago. And the problems that we're trying to solve in fund one are very different from fund two. So in fund one, solar was $4 a watt, uh, batteries were $1,000 a kilowatt hour. And so we were looking to invest in companies that could move the needle on that core energy production use side. In fund two, look, the solar and wind are already the cheapest energy, new energy sources in the world. So if utilities, governments, pension funds do their job and deploy this stuff at scale, then what's clean tech doing? Well, clean tech says, well, there's a wall of clean electrons coming. Let's make sure we use those electrons intelligently, distribute them intelligently, use them efficiently, use them to displace natural gas for heat. And so, so it's a different set of problems that we're solving uh, as a venture fund now than, than 10 years ago. But it's all about scale. Um, so now you can deploy things like energy efficiency through software at scale. Um, when we do heavy lifting, so the hydro stores of the world, I mean, this is big billion dollar infrastructure stuff. The only way it's gonna scale is if the innovation is at the systemic level. So you're not inventing a new compressor. You're not inventing a new mining technique to build the cavern. You're using existing Baker Hughes compressors and expanders that supply the oil and gas sector. You're leveraging existing engineering talent and, and techniques to mine what's underground so the geotechnical risk is minimized, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the innovation is at the systems level, not the component level. So that allows us as a venture fund to understand that, that as this company gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we're not providing venture capital to do that. It's going to graduate, and it's simply tapping known supply chains, tapping financial partners like Meridium, who can understand the risk at the systems level because the components are well understood. So there's a lot of, of, of stuff packed into that thesis. But on heavy lifting stuff, we look at systems level innovation, not component level innovation. And on things like efficiency and use of electrons, we're looking at things that scale very rapidly through the use of capital light sensor software, that kind of thing. Thank you. So that may be more detailed on it, but that's how we think about it. That, that's a, I think that provides a good enough information on how people see like how the how your personal like vision and passion and then how the actual fun is like a, doing and then in a sort of similar field but then slightly different and then now got two more two more questions on my list would like to share like uh share with you so one now like you touched earlier and then we sort of had a brief trip if just right before this is so COVID 19 like post COVID 19 and environment i mean we've seen enough i mean because of COVID 19 i mean environment seems to be get take taking a break so is there a few area you would suggest with people to see how like uh, what might be the significant change post COVID 19 in terms of climate like improvement this kind so like uh for those who are interested it can explore more right well i i sort of alluded at the highest level there's a different awareness of systemic risk and the importance of the public sector in addressing systemic risk and not ignoring experts for example um but at the more practical level um like none of us want to work from home five days a week we're social creatures but it turns out that we can do an awful lot many of us not all of us can do an awful lot of our work 
quite effectively from home. So what's the right number of days to commute to work? Is it five? Probably not. Why we're moving, you know, big pieces of flesh and metal long distances when really what we're sharing are our thoughts, our ideas, our communications, our voice, our image, and so on. And so telecommuting, which has been a promise of the internet for decades now, maybe it will finally come into its own. And if we commuted two days a week less, each of us, that's a bigger dent in emissions than anything coming out of my portfolio in the next five or 10 years. Like that's a massive change in emissions just through a behavioral change unlocked by Zoom or whatever. And then the other piece is business trips. Look, I mean, if people are honest, I'm, I'm gonna guess half of business trips are just because people want an excuse for an away game, right? They kind of want to get on a plane and go somewhere and have a nice meal and meet people, you know, they don't have to go there. I mean, you have to meet people for, for certain important, you have to look eyeball to eyeball. You're never going to replace that. But do you have to go to Vancouver for a board meeting? Probably not. Zoom probably does it. So I actually think maybe another 10 or 20%, 30% of business trips can be eliminated because we've discovered that we can do it remotely and, and we don't have that excuse we were looking for to get on a plane and go somewhere, right? Now we can stay at home and get it done. And those two things by themselves would take a bigger chunk out of emissions than almost anything I've seen for a while. So I'm kind of hoping that these low carbon ways of commuting, communicating, uh, being present uh, in business, um, I'm hoping that they stick to some extent, just, you know, some portion of commuting and business flying is eliminated forever. That would be nice. That'd be a great outcome. I would love that too. So one, just a one short and quick follow up question. So would you, would you, cause you mentioned a Zoom like a few times and all the virtual things. So would you say like you've been in the clean tech like a uh, space for some times? Would you see like a uh, potentially the clean tech like investor would categorize like uh, those virtual two being in 100%. your portfolio? Hundred percent, absolutely. We have we have this discussion every day at Arcturn. What is clean tech? What counts as impact? Um, and, 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 and there's lots of questions around that, right? So if you make a, uh, a fish farm more efficient, is that clean tech? If you make an oil and gas production site more efficient, is that clean tech? I would say the first is, the second is not. Um, is telecommuting clean tech? 100%. If you're, if you're eliminating movement of goods and people, people in particular, um, yet you still have the same economic outcome, that's an efficiency play. And I would argue that's clean tech 100%. I mean, it all depends on what behavioral change it, it gets, right? So the promise of Zoom is that it eliminates some commuting. If it doesn't eliminate computing, then it's not a clean tech play. It's just a telecom play. But if it does eliminate some, some commuting, then of course it's clean tech. That's what I mean about we're solving different kinds of problems today than 10 years ago. So I guess I like, saw so maybe after this interview or maybe after you spread this film more, you'll get even more email or content from those Entrepreneur doing virtual to say, Tom, like we are clean tech startup, but they like, they are like uh sort of like virtual too. But thanks for sharing. So I would like to close this interview by one like the last question is the letter to your son, like the rule, because I toward to the end of the book, right? You wrote the you sort of like I wouldn't necessarily close, but you have a few other things after the letter. But one day, like what was like the intention, if you don't mind sharing, like I it, it could get it's kind of personal, but then the, having that later there, and then also what would, is there any other additional message you would like to share with us? Like we do have a, quite a bit of student audience. What would be the message you would like to share with them? Yeah, so in terms of the letter to my son, um, look, it's actually it's actually really tempting um, to sort of retreat from this problem, right? I live on a beautiful apple farm. Uh, it would be nice to kind of just make cider and hang out with my kid and not worry about this anymore. Like those who understand what climate is, it is disquieting, it is depressing, it is a psychological toll that you bear when you understand the scope of this problem because the future is not gonna be like the past. And so it's tempting to sort of retreat into you know family bliss. But I need my son to see me try because he will see a changed world. And I need him to know his dad tried to stop it. And he won't understand that for a number of years, right? He's two and a half. So it's not like I can get away with doing a little more clean tech for a year or two and suddenly my son's proud of me. I'm gonna have to do this until I'm an old man because he's gonna need to see me at this 
when he's older. And that's just me wanting my son to be proud of me. Um, and the letter in the book is just another piece of that. Uh, it is directly to him. And it is something I hope he reads um, many years from now. And he feels that I meant it when I wrote it. And uh, I'm trying to communicate to other people, to the readers of that book, that these are real emotions that we have when we think about climate. These are real motivating reasons to act on this thing. And we shouldn't pretend that we're somehow distant from those emotions and feelings. This is part of our work. This is why we do what we do. I care about humanity. I care about my son. I want, it, I want my son to be proud of me. And the best way to do that is to have him see me active on the biggest problem that he and his generation will, will, will face. Um, so that's and, why I wrote that letter. And I'm sure you will send a very, like, uh, good message when, I mean, as he starts to understand, like, not like uh, a lot of things that like Clinton and the climate and this. So that, I really admire that place that it's just a very admirable thing. But we actually got a big question. Come on, I hope you don't mind. Like, one more question. So, no. Gary, like, us, what do you think? of the hype in the US about the Green New Deal? <laughs> That's a really, really, really good question. Um, the Green New Deal is not dissimilar from something called the LEAP Manifesto that came out in Canada about two or three years ago. And I didn't sign on to the LEAP Manifesto. The reason I didn't sign on is because it was a grab bag of all very good problems that we want to solve. But the idea was you have to solve everything at once, social housing, social justice, um, injustice to the native community. Uh, name your issue and it's all part of a package. And there's nowhere in that package that utilities were talked about, money was talked about, banks. So it just seemed like a grab bag of, of ideas that are separately good but they're packaged together like you can't approach the climate problem without also solving uh, social housing or something. And, I, and we live in a democracy. In a democracy, you need to build a big tent. And uh, you don't build a bigger tent by putting more of, the, of righteous left-wing issues on a list and saying this list needs to be addressed because the tent has to be bigger, right? We have trouble in this country passing a revenue neutral carbon tax, right? That was a contentious political issue. You think La Revolution is less contentious and is more likely to pass political muster? So I don't think it works in, in Canada. I think, I, I think it's a distraction from the compromise, the hard work that, we, that needs to be done reaching across the aisle to those that don't agree with you about everything to get us to act together on climate. That's the real work we need to do. Um, and to be dismissive of compromise, I think, is naive and a bit holier than that. However, that said, the United States is uniquely broken. It is uniquely politically corrupt. And the public is legitimately dismissive of an entire political class because they are not representative of what people want. If you can't pass a gun law, that has 90% popular support, which is one of 15 they tried to pass after the, the Newtown uh, tragedy. They couldn't pass any of them. One of them had 90% popular support. That's not a democracy. That's a broken political system, now best exemplified by that ridiculous orange-haired man in the White House. It is a corrupt political system. In such a system, you do need to find a way to motivate people to get out and vote and participate in a system that they see as corrupt. In a country where common sense stuff like healthcare and minimum wage and gun laws and so on that, the, that are vastly popular across the population are somehow seen as extreme leftist stuff. In a country like that, I think you do need something to bring people together, get them excited and have them march on Washington on that. So I think in the United States, the Green New Deal as a grab bag of issues has merit because of the uniquely corrupt system in which they are operating. In Canada, I have my problems with politicians like everybody else, but we are not corrupt like the United States. And we don't have the same need to build an angry, massive populist backlash against our federal government because they're not hated the way they are in the United States. Thank you so much. To Very good. 
I, there's a lot packed in there. <laughs> yeah, and then I blend a lot myself as well. And then uh, thanks again for joining us. I mean, it's always good to see like another passionate person about the topic. I mean, I personally interested in the climate thing, but definitely I I know little only, so learn a lot. And then from you and the book, so for anyone who actually interested in the talk today, I mean, there's actually a lot of detail, and then like a Tom certainly shared a lot of insights of in his book. So. If anyone's interested, check out the book. And then I want to thank Tom again for spending your time. And then hopefully we'll get to catch up again in Toronto sometime soon. Although, I mean, the beautiful farm might keep you away from Toronto for some time. But hope to see you again in Toronto in the near future. I look so, forward to it. Thank you for the chance to speak today. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye-bye.